This is CBC Vancouver News. We need something to change. We need something better. Middle housing! Rally! Rallying for more housing, residents of the downtown east side send a message to incoming council at City Hall and... It is a little early to see snow of any kind at sea level this time of the year. Metro Vancouver's first snowfall. What meteorologists say is in store for the rest of winter. Plus... The Prime Minister's not a potted plant. He can defend his position if he wishes, but there should be a meeting. Clash over Medicare. Why BC's health minister is calling out the Prime Minister as the provinces and feds get set to talk funding. Good evening, I'm Leanne Young. Thanks for joining us. A new council is set to take the reins tomorrow at Vancouver City Hall. Just ahead of Ken Sims' inauguration as mayor, residents in the downtown east side took to the streets to send Sim and his council a message. Don't forget about us. Dozens marched down East Hastings Street to demand more housing. Our Yasmin Gandam was there. Signs reading housing is a human right and no displacement eviction kills as residents of the downtown east side marched demanding housing rights. Where are the people of downtown east side going to go if there's no proper housing for anybody? Errol Marion lives in an SRO in the neighborhood. He says he's been living with a broken window for over two months and water that isn't clean. They're just trying to kill us off and like putting us in decrepit old buildings which they should just tear down or like remodel it like uh, renovate it and make sure that everything's is all up to code like the uh, fire sprinklers the the alarms the fire detectors the Water. Vancouver Mayor-elect Ken Sim is to be inaugurated Monday. He's campaigned on the promise to hire 100 more cops and 100 mental health nurses to help with public safety, as well as speed up the city's housing development permitting process. But people here say that isn't going to fix the problem. The money that he wants to get those cops out, why can't they, why can't he put that money towards housing. But for now, it's why residents are living in tents because they say the conditions are better than the housing provided. We're not exactly optimistic that this council is going to bring that. So people are out here today to put pressure and start the fight for over the next four years to get better housing and better safety. But what can Sims do as mayor? Political insiders say there are options. Provide some leadership and direction and really push BC housing to step up with some of these sort of solutions that are more immediate. Uh, perhaps purchase units that are currently held privately, but then once units are under city control, really investing the resources necessary to ensure that they are livable conditions. Until then, these residents vow to keep up the fight for housing for all. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. And in Surrey, the city's new council and mayor will also be sworn in tomorrow. The inauguration ceremony for Mayor-elect Brenda Locke and eight councillors will take place at City Hall at 7 p.m. Locke brings with her four of her Surrey Connect members. She unseated Doug McCallum with a 28% vote and says her priority is reversing the transition to a municipal police force. You can watch the ceremony live at surrey.ca. It has been a weekend of wicked weather. After Friday night's destructive windstorm, much of the province saw snow today. In a bit of an early start to wintry conditions, Environment Canada issued snowfall warnings for regions throughout the province, including an Arctic outflow warning for parts of northern coastal BC. It is a little early to see snow of any kind at sea level this time of the year. Normally our first sort of brush with wet snow isn't until late November and any sort of substantial snow doesn't happen until December. Meteorologists say forecasts show the possibility for a colder than normal winter in BC. Environment Canada is warning everyone to minimize exposure and be mindful of strong Arctic winds. Snowfall warnings are also in place for highways, including parts of the Coquihalla, Highway 3 and the Okanagan Connector. Once you get up to the higher elevations like the, the summit here, um, 
the weather can change quite quickly. Uh, so we may see snow and we may not see snow, but um, always prepare for the worst case. Road maintenance companies have to respond quickly to the conditions on the island. Environment Canada has issued a snowfall warning for the coast from Nanaimo to Duncan. Expect up to 10 centimeters of snow by Monday morning. Leave the bike lanes in Stanley Park alone. That's the message from a group of cyclists to the newly elected Vancouver Park Board. <laughs> Participants of the Love the Lane rally gathered for a spin around the park to show support for the bike path. They say they've heard incoming commissioners say the temporary lane would be removed for the winter and a new redesigned one would be installed by next summer. But they say removing the lane now would make it more dangerous because it's getting darker earlier. We do love cycling in winter. It's really great for your physical and mental health. And the other reason is that the, uh, the um, seawall bike path that goes around the outside, it's closed for three weeks every year for um, cliff maintenance work. But also the last two winters, uh, it's been closed for weeks at a time due to catastrophic um, storm damage. They also worry if the lane is removed, it won't be ready by the summer, if at all. WestJet is warning there could be more flight disruptions after a system-wide data problem forced hundreds of cancellations this weekend. We're working as hard as we can to get everybody to their uh, to the destination they wanted to go, but uh, the impact has been and actually still is uh, severe. It started around 3 in the afternoon yesterday when an air conditioner failed inside WestJet's main data center, causing a nine-hour system shutdown. Passengers at YVR today were frustrated as they dealt with delays and plenty of uncertainty. I know if I'm going to get to Prince George this week. <laughs> I was one of the unfortunate ones. My bag, they know they have it. They're just not sure where it is right now. Like, where is their customer service? You know, it's an epic failure by an IT department, an epic failure by a company. WestJet says flights were up and running again this morning, but many airplanes were in the wrong place, and clearing that backlog remains a huge task. All of Canada's health ministers will be here in Vancouver tomorrow for a conference with the federal government. It's something the premiers have urged and will be the first in-person meeting since the pandemic arrived. The issue, Canada's health care crisis and who will pay to fix it. Marina von Stackelberg reports. Let's make a house. This toddler has been waiting years for routine urinary tract surgery. And we have no timeline, no options, nothing. It's, it's, it's really, really frustrating. In Quebec, an elderly patient died after not being seen for 16 hours. Just some of the stories from Canada's healthcare system in the last few weeks alone. The provinces are responsible for providing health care, but they partially rely on federal dollars to do it. A fight over how much Ottawa should pay continues to build. One that has gotten so heated, Canada's premiers launched an advertising campaign about it. But we need the federal government to restore funding now to keep our systems strong. The provinces want Ottawa to increase its share of health care costs from 22% up to 35%. But they don't believe the federal government is interested in a real conversation about it, says BC's health minister in an interview on Rosemary Barton Live. The federal government has not been willing to do the work to come to the table and to sit down, prime ministers and premier, and talk about, I think, one of the central issues facing the country. And so that's disappointing. Ottawa promised to boost the amount of money it gave once the pandemic was over. It comes through the Canada Health Transfer, the single largest chunk of money from the federal government to the provinces. They're expected to receive a total of $45 billion this year. This summer, Ottawa injected an extra $2 billion. We were going to focus next week on the results that we want jointly to achieve. Ottawa says what the provinces do with money it sends them needs to be tied to tangible and concrete improvements to Canada's health care system. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And Health Minister Adrian Dix will be co-hosting that meeting between the federal government and the provinces. He spoke at length with Rosemary Barton about his frustrations and explained why he and his provincial counterparts launched an ad campaign blaming Ottawa for health care failures. The ad campaign uh, came after 10 months of asking uh, for a meeting. Uh, 
And just so people are understand, Premier Horgan has worked closely on innumerable files with mm -hmm. the Prime Minister in his time. Premier Eby has the same approach. So we are absolutely willing to work with the federal government. But this idea that uh, with a national with national issues and issues facing healthcare in every single province and territory in the country, that the federal government can just sort of play a defiant game and play games around this. They need to come and meet, and the prime minister needs to come meet in the premiers. And the prime minister is not a potted plant. He can defend his position if mm -hmm. he wishes, mm -hmm. but there should be a meeting. And so we'll be delivering that message. That hasn't stopped us, of course, from continuing to work together on healthcare issues, notably uh, COVID-19, notably the public health emergency that's the overdose crisis in BC and issues like health human resources. Yeah. But it is kind of a fundamental underlying question about how we support and finance the healthcare system across Canadian uh, uh, provinces and the role of the federal government in that. And, and I don't quite understand the Prime Minister's position. I very much respect Minister Duclos, but I do not understand the Prime Minister's position that he doesn't want to sit down and do the work. Well, for the first time in six years, the BC Lions hosted a playoff game here at home. The team embraced home field advantage decisively, beating the Calgary Stampeders to make their way to the Western Final and delighting tens of thousands of fans at BC Place. As Janella Hamilton reports, today's win is a far cry from last season when the team struggled just to stay on top. This time it ends in defeat. BC Lions 30 to 16. Victory never tasted so sweet for the BC Lions, winning 30 to 16 against the Calgary Stampeders in front of a monstrous home crowd of 31,000 roaring fans. We thank our fans for, for showing up in a big way today and, and being part of this win. A stark difference from last year after a tough 2021 season, winning only five games compared to 12 games this year. Wide receiver Keon Hatcher says the success of this season in part due to a renewed sense of connectedness among the team. We're together um, through thick and thin. Um, it doesn't matter we're up or down, we're going to stay together. Um, it doesn't matter who makes the plays, we're all happy. Go! That happiness shared by fans, excited to see a playoff game on home turf for the first time in six years. I think it's something extraordinary, something we don't get to experience uh, very often. So uh, when the time does come, you take advantage of it, get out there and support the team. We love the VC Lions! We want VC Lions to come home one! Support felt by fans, young and old. It's exciting, especially with the two years without games. Makes it makes it even more. Yeah. Yeah, go. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so exciting to see BC Sports getting up and at it again. And especially since COVID, we haven't been able to see something like this. So I'm loving it. That electric energy starting before the doors even opened, filling the stadium with anticipation. A memorable first playoff experience for Victoria native and new Lions quarterback Nathan Rourke. Being a player, there's there's nothing no nothing quite like that amount of people who are cheering you on, and the fact that they had to go on silent count like that, it's really messed with the timing of an offense. And I thought that was really great to have um, that kind of the, the fans to have that kind of impact on the game. With this win, the Lions will be headed east to take on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers next week, with fans holding out hope for another big win. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. More than 120 world leaders are gathered in Egypt to tackle the climate crisis. An inside look at the start of the negotiations at COP27. That story after the break.
The UN's annual climate change summit, COP27, is underway. More than 120 world leaders are meeting in Egypt for talks on potential solutions. And as the CBC's Chris Brown reports, the conference comes after a year of extreme weather. The world has arrived in Egypt's desert to take another crack at preventing the planet from overheating. Just down the highway, there's a modest but important example of what's at stake. The Sinai's bleakness is broken at the water's edge by a rare cluster of mangroves here. The salt water resistant trees play an oversized role fighting climate change, says this conservationist. One of the most uh, important things to mitigate is to increase uh, uh, mangrove trees which sequester uh, carbon dioxide. It's said that it is sequester four times the uh, tropical forests of carbon dioxide. A bit hotter or drier, and these plants on the edge of the Red Sea might all be gone. And if they die, all of the CO2 they've sucked out of the air over their lifetime will be released. So conserving the, uh, the mangrove is much more important even than restoring what has been destroyed of it. But the summit began with grim news that keeping global warming to one and a half degrees is now unlikely. So developing nations have successfully added discussions over compensation for past climate damage to the COP27 talks. I particularly welcome the agreement of the parties to include a new agenda item on funding arrangements to respond to loss and damage. That's going to be a hard sell, as many wealthy countries, including Canada, worry the sky's the limit with potential claims. Instead, their preference is to focus on helping countries mitigate and adapt now. Most of the major countries, um, including across Europe and the US, don't even have a domestic policy on how to compensate or manage climate damage at home, let alone abroad. African nations contribute just 4% of the world's greenhouse gases, but stand to be hurt hardest by climate change through droughts, floods and a drop in food production. Egypt's government appears eager to demonstrate that it has the diplomatic clout needed to secure an agreement that benefits the whole continent. Civil society groups, though, see a different agenda that is trying to greenwash a terrible record on human rights and political freedoms. Chris Brown, CBC News in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. There was more tough language from Iranian authorities today on the unrelenting anti-government protests. A statement signed by about three-quarters of Iran's parliamentarians is urging what it calls decisive action from the courts against the protesters. It comes on the heels of Iran's president twice calling the protests a U.S. destabilization attempt and insisting it had failed. They persisted, though, today. Activists said there were rallies at a dozen universities. At least 19 people are dead after a passenger plane crashed in Tanzania. It came down at the edge of Lake Victoria. 43 people were on board. 24 survived. The two pilots survived the crash, but they were found dead after reporting their oxygen supply dwindling. The accident happened in the middle of storms and heavy rain. The man who many believe was racially profiled by Montreal police is talking about his ordeal. His handcuffing was captured on camera and went viral on social media. There are growing demands for an apology. The CBC's Rowan Kennedy has the story. Is it because I'm black, says Bryce Dosa, outraged after police stopped him last week? He was walking to his car in a Montreal mall parking lot when plain-clothed officers handcuffed him. Police said they thought his car was stolen after seeing marks around the keyhole. CBC News has confirmed the car is new and there are no marks. You handcuffed me and you don't even have the keys, he says. Police verified it was his vehicle, but Doza says they didn't have the key to release him. More officers arrived 15 minutes later, and the handcuffs were removed. I feel traumatized. I feel traumatized. I feel that um, I've been humiliated. I've been humiliated, and this is a, is a discrimination. Dosa came here three years ago from Benin and works as an orderly. I'm scared of police now because... They can do anything. I don't trust the police anymore. 
Outrage on social media over the now viral video spread quickly, and it coincided with a forum on racial profiling here in Montreal this weekend. The organizers are calling for Montreal police to apologize. You need grounds, reasonable suspicion, to arrest someone. Did they have any? Our own Premier, Mr. François Legault, as well the entire CAQ government, need to recognize that systemic racism exists. Following calls by Quebec government ministers on social media, Montreal's police department has opened an administrative investigation to shed light on the events. The city councillor responsible for public security calls the video troubling. Alain Vaillancourt says events like these affect people's trust in police. No one says sorry to me. No one says sorry. Dosa says he's filed a complaint with Montreal police and is not ruling out taking legal action. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. And this was Whistler this afternoon. Back to being a winter wonderland after steady snow came down and stuck to the ground, as you can see. Is there more of the white stuff ahead? I will have your full forecast next. It's been tough to find wild mushrooms in the province due to drought. <coughs> Excuse me. But members of the South Island Mycological Society still managed to put on their very popular fungi show. 
local fungi need abundant rainfall to fruit in the autumn. They haven't had that rainfall, and so this is really the the worst year for mushrooms fruiting in our forests that I've seen in more than three decades. Still, given all of that, we've managed to collect more than a hundred different species of mushrooms that we've got displayed on the tables here. Experts say these fungi species are critical for our ecosystems and the reason behind the wide range of wildlife we have in the province. The harvest of wild mushrooms is a multi-million dollar industry in BC each fall. Those exports mainly go to Japan and Europe. Let's take a look at that forecast now, starting with your weather warnings. All that in red along the coast, those are Arctic airflow warnings for that stretch of the coastal region. Expecting very chilly temperatures and towards the interior, snowfall warnings anywhere up to 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. Temperatures across the south coast tonight, cool as you can see, and they're about to drop even further as we head through the week. Tomorrow's forecast though, if you're in Dees Lake, looking sunny, minus 16. In Prince Rupert, looking at a minus two and sunny. Port Hardy also looking at sunshine at two degrees though. Seven degrees for Victoria if you're in Williams Lake looking at a mix of snow and possibly some sunshine in through the afternoon. Williams Lake and Kelowna expecting some snowfall freezing mark for the interior. And here's how it looks across Metro Vancouver for the next five days. Tomorrow we're expecting some showers, mostly in the morning hours. And then by the time you get through the afternoon, expecting a mostly cloudy afternoon. Five degrees will be our high and then three degrees overnight. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can see sunny for all of those days, but temperatures start getting quite cool as you head into the evening hours. You can see we're actually dropping below the freezing mark for the first time uh, this winter season. So it will be cold, so bundle up as we head through the rest of the week. And that does it for us this Sunday. Thank you for watching this weekend. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbc.ca slash bc. I'll see you back here next weekend. Have a good evening.